Hey listeners, Claire here. The episode you're about to hear is actually a panel discussion from the annual conference of the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. We recorded it live on January 16th, 2023, and cut it down a bit for your ears today. The panel was called Stop Talking, Start Listening, finding common ground with young arts workers and the future of our field. I'm so excited for you to hear this great conversation, so let's go live to New York City. You're listening to Arts Work Life, a podcast from APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. I'm your host, Claire Caulfield, here with a special bonus episode from the APAP conference in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. We have an amazing group of young arts workers here who are all under the age of 35, and they've bravely agreed to share their candid takes about their experiences to help the entire industry create a more sustainable future. And with that, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. My name is Lexis Hamilton. I am the presenter and program coordinator for the University of Wyoming, located in Laramie, Wyoming. Hello, everybody. My name is Bobby Sento. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I work uh, as a booking agent for Ed Keen Associates. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Javier Stelfresques. I use um, all pronouns. And I am a I'm performing artist as well as a producer of festivals. Good morning, everyone. Tariq Darrell O'Mealy here. I work at the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center at the University of Maryland. I'm a part of our multi programming team, along with uh, the creator and curator of the Black Light Summit. Lovely. And my first question today is for Bobby, but I hope the other panelists will jump in with every question. Um, Bobby, there's been a lot of hand-wringing about how young people just jump from job to job and they don't have any loyalty to their employer. Um, have you seen this kind of job hopping, if you want to call it? Um, why is this happening and how can organizations respond? Yeah, definitely, Claire. I've seen through uh, peers and colleagues and friends um, and hearing their stories. Um, I think the, the overall theme that a lot of them face is the, the rising cost of living. Um, not only with that, but then uh, cost of tuition and loans and things like that. Um, it's a big driver for uh, people, especially young people, to feel the pressure, you know, to need to not necessarily feel like they need to stay in one position for uh, more than a couple years at a time. Um, so that's definitely a big thing I've seen um, and becoming a trend, you know, in, in this kind of labor culture that we see today. Um, and in, in terms of things that uh, organizations can do to address it, uh, it can be a variety of tools and resources that they can provide. One of them um, just providing um, a more healthy work-life balance. Um, it shouldn't be you know, expected that to, to find a healthy work-life balance is going to be the exception. It should be more of the norm, and I think uh, people are looking you know, to, to not necessarily settle for something that might be um, not providing them you know, the best work-life balance or the most um, freedom to, you know, to do what they still need to do to live a happy and, he more importantly, healthy life. Um, but you know, to also know that if that is not something that they can achieve at the current, uh, in the current situation that they're facing, that they can still find that somewhere else um, and that that opportunity can still be existent for them somewhere. Um, so yeah. Without going too deep into the minutia, I think uh, when we're talking about millennials and Gen Z, which is way more aggressive than anything we've seen previous in a way that's kind of beautiful, is that we're without the illusion of the American dream. So when we're talking about we're, we're, we're leaving jobs because we don't, the planet feels weird and we don't know that we have 10, 20, or 30 years to completely invest into a thing or like retirement or doing things like buying property or, so I think without the illusion of a dream to that this will ultimately pay off. It's becoming clear that it might not, and that makes it difficult uh, in the uh, morale. Like, morale is down, so like, if you want people to stay at your job, it's a human being in um, you know, so much of performance. I come, I'm a dance, uh, predominantly in dance, and so much of the work used to be leave it at the door, and that's just disassociation, so it feels like the farther apart we got, the more integrated we become with our feelings. So I just think uh, it's about um, not per se another dream, but like building uh, useful realities. Sorry. 
And that segues even better to what I wanted to ask Javier about. Um, when we were talking earlier, you brought up this idea of scaling down. Can you explain what you mean by scaling down and how organizations might be able to implement that idea? Sure, hello. Absolutely. Um, I've, in order to answer this question, I think I need to give some more context to where I'm speaking from. Um, I am based in the Bay Area, and um, I make work there primarily with indigenous communities. Um, I've worked with nonprofits of the scale of, let's say, an annual festival producer, larger dance festival producer, and smaller. At that scale, at least, it really feels like there are so many folks with the um, illusion that if they do more, it will be better. They will make more grants. They will be able to demonstrate a, a greater impact. And more and more, I'm just really, if, if anyone approaches me for collaboration or for, cons, for consulting, um, that's often the first thing I will check on. Are you, have you downscaled in the last few times that your budget dropped? Have you absorbed the shock that it sent your team? Um, have you taken care of your team when uh, you had to uh, cut the team short? Or did five jobs get piled onto uh, one pair of shoulders? And I also just want to say that within our field especially, I just want to name prolific, uh, lifting up an artist that is prolific as one of the virtues of what an artist needs to be. There's a way that the uh, idea of product over process is really, really uh, drains the artists that we all rely on and that we um, want to be supporting, hopefully, for their next step, not just their engagement with our organization. And I think, yeah, just trying to switch overall to a culture and an ethic of care versus maximal productivity can allow us to, be, to respond to the fact that the newer generations are aware and have the language around mm -hmm. what is a space that is just trying to extract labor from me mm -hmm. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and with, like, there's all kinds of labor to consider in that. There's, like, there's the emotional labor of a person uh, who is not of your work culture or doesn't quite fit in immediately. Um, who then has to either code switch, because they're coming from a different ethnic culture, um, or from a different class background, in order to be able to produce with the team to be a good team player. I'm putting all of these in air quotes because I really think that we should interrogate them more, how we think about these things, from the hiring table to uh, dealing with conflict in the workspace. Then there's also just, yeah, simply putting too many jobs on a single person and um, not asking the question, what's the truly bare minimum we can do to just at least keep operating? Um, a really easy example is social media. Like, your young interns or, or your young staff, when they come on board, just because of their youth or because of their relative skill with social media does not mean that they should even, that they should even necessarily be suggested that they be the social media manager. That is a big job. <laughs> and it's a huge responsibility to take on the voice of an organization. Um, I will, oh, one more thing, one more thing that I really wanted to lift up about that. Um, as a festival producer, is that annual festivals are definitely also unsustainable for most of the presenters that I see in the Bay Area. Um, but I just want to say that I really appreciate um, when a festival takes its time to know and to approach with intention each of its years and its team each year. Um, there are of quite a few festivals actually that have um, asked me to work with them, but because I know their team is stressed, uh, because it does not get off the annual frequency rhythm, um, I have turned them down. So yeah. And it seems like the thread there is a call to really approach the work with being super intentional 
and not saying that we can be all things for all communities because every time you reach out a hand to a different community, they have different needs, they have different wants, and they can tell if maybe you're virtu virtue signaling or just parachuting in for this one play or this one performance and then leaving. Um, does anyone want to pick up on, on that thread of when they've seen a lack of intentionality in some of their, some of their work? We're really trying to figure out how to interact with all of the things that for you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years that people swallowed. So um, our emotional intelligence and the, the desire to respond really turns into a reaction and I think sometimes comes from a place of fear. So in order not to be um, uh, the now appropriated cancel culture, which was like something like black people used to use, but now we're like everyone's being canceled, um, to try to really figure out what's the best way for us to move forward. But uh, my good friend Shanice Mason, who's working with APAP, says all the time, I don't know if we're asking enough questions and I don't know if we're asking the right questions. So, and when you're talking about scaling, uh, we didn't get here overnight, so it's gonna take a little bit of time and pacing and iterations and not to, I don't own a house, um, I rent, but I assume you can't renovate the whole thing at the same time and live in it well. So what pieces can you, in increments, take care of um, without um, feeling crushed by uh, the necessity to uh, be better? So it's kind of like a, a brick, brick by brick, I think. Yeah, I think uh, transformations take time. And um, if you want to be, um, if you want to be in pace, really, with the transformations that are happening around you in the field um, and in society, I think that that requires scaling back what you produce so that you can do the work internally. And land acknowledgments, um, they're definitely one of those virtue signally things um, that uh, I have been tasked to ask people um, frequently, why are you doing them? Keep asking yourself, why are you doing them? This is a question coming from an Ohlone culture bearer who kind of championed the use of land acknowledgments in the Bay Area a good, probably for the last full decade. Um, and when she sat with um, myself and the director of the theater there that I produce a festival of two-spirit performance at, she, I made sure that the director was, was there at the conversation for this conversation about land acknowledgments, and she just opened up the question as to why. And the different indigenous people in the room had full answers, and the director, not so much. Um, but they really heard what we were saying, and they immediately put into practice some of the deeper principles and the deeper whys for indigenous people of using a land acknowledgement. They put that, the director themselves put that into practice at our festival um, and got vulnerable. That's one of the biggest things about that learning process that I can hand off. Get vulnerable in that process of asking why. Do you think there's a generational divide in how we see virtue signaling or seeing community outreach efforts? I'm gonna jump in on this one. I think, yes, I think we tend to be more self-aware of what's going on in society. And, and in when you say we, what, what we group is that? We as young arts workers mm -hmm. and people in our fields. I think we're more aware than some of the older, as you would say, experts in our field and know what our communities should need. I'm speaking from a Wyoming per, um, place where 90% of our community is white and doesn't have a lot of cultural representation. So for groups that like we bring in as a presenter- Whiteness you, is a culture. I, it, it, no, it, no, you are correct, it is. <laughs> but I'm just yeah. saying other cultures besides the white culture as mm -hmm. well. We try to bring in groups that have different, uh, different knowledge and they can bring something new and refreshing to our community that they need to see. And how do you do that intentionally and without it being exploitative or to, to build something? Um, I do, we do not book groups that play up to the stereotypes of whatever culture that is, if that answers that question. 
And if you have a mostly white group mm -hmm. who is planning these performances or deciding what is a stereotype and what isn't, how do you navigate that? That's a challenging question. <laughs> Since I am white, I ask other people of whatever, so I'm just using this as an example. Um, we want to bring in like a Latinx group, mariachi group. I'm not from that culture, so I'm going to ask and be reassured by someone from that culture that this isn't like virtue signaling and it's not a stereotypical performance of what you should be able to see to market to a white community because you don't want that, right? Mm -hmm. So we just have to rely on other people. And a lot of um, arts organizations might have tight budgets in that role where you're reaching out for someone for expertise. Is that a paid consulting position? How do you deal with the labor that they bring? Connections in your community. That's the best way. I, I think that's the best way to get an honest opinion. Yeah, I'll thank, you, thank you for that, that thread of questions. Um, I think um, more and more that kind of labor also needs to be valued um, much more highly. Um, the moment that someone is translating their culture or to answer the question of, are we the right people to be putting on this performance? Um, yeah, the moment that conversation starts, the person whose culture is being um, desired is often doing a lot of work. That's an incredibly valuable skill that too often is not immediately compensated. And too often people think that it's okay for that to be the last thing in the budget. Um, visibility is not enough. So yeah, so just pay people for the work that they do, all of it. And that pay is a good segue to a question that I wanted to ask um, Lexis about. I know that you've had the experience where you're maybe working two or three jobs or you're the only one in your department. Um, what's that experience been like and what changes would you like to be seeing in the industry? I feel like I'm not alone in the sentiment that you, um, as a young arts worker, our generation um, we're just go, go, go and very ambitious all the time. So sometimes that ends up morphing into a couple jobs that after the pandemic, those people have left or they were laid off. And all of that gets piled onto your hands. And we mentioned social media earlier. If you give suggestions about social media, like, hey, we shouldn't be writing essays on a Facebook post. That's just, nobody has the attention span or for that. Or using Facebook. Like, no. Or Facebook. <laughs> I still use it. Still use Facebook, it. Instagram, all the things. <laughs> um, and then they take your suggestion as like, oh, well, then you can do it better. And so now that has been piled onto your position. So it's just the awareness of we can't do it all. We want to, but we can't, and it's very hard. What do you feel when you hear that idea of young people shouldn't be advocating for more work-life balance or higher wages because it, this is our time to pay our dues? It's not the same equation. We've lived through a series of financial crises, perhaps the end of the world. I don't know. There are a lot of like um, exacerbating circumstances, and not that this needs to be like uh, the Suffering Olympics or comparative analysis. It's just um, uh, what is I'm reading. Of, that's a lie. I'm listening to Viola Davis's um, memoir, <laughs> um, and something she says is like. Um, not basically, I'm paraphrasing here, not having options is what it means to struggle. And paying your dues is a kind of a thing. It's just running for seven days a week and not having a savings and having to work three jobs at your job and then an additional one in order to make things work will change how people are feeling. And then if there's no um, release or no respite and you're like, in 20 more years, um, during the great flood, you will be okay. It, 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 it's just like, that, that's a hard sell. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, lo I'm loving the apocalyptic imagery. I really am here dark. for them. Like it's, I, wish I, I wish I could join you on that frequency, but it's too early in the morning for my brain. But um, I, I think that that, it's like that, that that logic, that set of logics around paying one's dues, um, I think maybe ask yourself if you find yourself saying those kinds of things or thinking those kinds of things about a young worker in the space, um, what discomfort, what resistance to change, what resistance to growth that might be coming from. 
the expectations around their youth um, or the thoughts around their youth, the projections from you and from the work culture onto their youth. I think, um, so stereotype threat is, for folks who don't know, it's, it's uh, the anticipation and the work you have to do anticipating people's stereotyping of you. And that can be along any kind of identity um, category. Um, and of course it's worse when you're of a more marginalized class where the power dynamic does not favor you because if you do fulfill the stereotypes in those situations, that often undercuts your legitimacy, your safety. So just having that kind of stereotype threat and that kind of cognitive dissonance around, oh, I am the youngest person in this team, but I don't want to come off like all these things that I feel being projected at me. Mm -hmm. So let me pretend to be different or let me assimilate harder into this work culture that, oh, by the way, it's burning out everyone else who's here. <laughs> so how am I going to do a different thing? All of that, that, all of that stereotype threat labor gets in the way of even doing the work that you need them to do. And that's true of every kind of stereotype threat. It's like how um, it's Toni Morrison who says uh, racism's primary function is to distract us from the actual work that we have to do or the actual... Yeah, yeah. It's okay. yeah. and so it's very true of, of ageism as well. So yeah, I think if we can just be present with the workspace and think critically about what professionalism entails and ways of performing it and narrow ways of gendering people, of expecting them to be of certain class background, the ableism that's in that too, all of that I think comes out and comes, becomes very clear when you interrogate things like professionalism, with, with, which ties into classism, which ties into paying your dues. Mm. And among all of the things that we're experiencing right now, the class issue's real distinctive. If you're coming at an entry-level position, uh, paying your dues to stay exactly where you are feels weird. Like, nobody's budget is increasing, like, and you're just like, you will be at, um, you know, 45 um, until the dawn, until we come back again. So it's, I think the class issue, and I, and I also wanna offer the point of this conversation is to, at least for me, to like really emphasize the, the interior experience of people, if you are not a young arts professional that's going on and like the real kind of adversity, especially being and consistently justifying being in the arts when we know that um, there's kind of a, a siphoning off of resources. It, it makes it more difficult and you just see the gap getting wider and all of these different things. It just makes it uh, hard to lean in and hard to like show up and continue to do the five jobs if you're just, it's like, oh, is this, uh, I think someone like a Sisyphus re reference. The, uh, I think someone said here, you know, the boulder just gets bigger each time it rolls down the hill, so. We've thrown out a lot of big ideas, a lot of suggestions for change. Do you think that the industry is open, willing, wanting to change? Um, short answer, no, not really. Um, I think uh, we're in love with our limitations. There are certain things we're like, wow, this is really not working. Hey, Jack, do you want to go to the bottom of the ship and sink with it? So I think there is the, now I'm being like, uh, you know, snarky, but genuinely I think the desire is there, but all magic has a price. So if you want this to do this, you have to, you have to give something back, exchange something. And I think that's a kind of a hard thing to negotiate coming from dance. You know, your, your muscle memory is to respond to a thing in a certain way. So if you are not actually, if you're not vigilant in your practices and your intentionality and your scale, it makes it uh, difficult for anything to shift. Uh, the, I would say I'm coming from concert dance. I think we're in a bit of a, an identity crisis and that existential crisis is making us um, we don't know what to do next because we've never, I'm not gonna say never, I've only been here 34 years. I don't know what never means. Um, it's difficult to really figure out, look at yourself and understand, okay, if the emperor doesn't have any clothes, how do I start sewing the garment, I guess. I think we're collecting the note cards right now, so final thoughts before we get into audience questions. 
No? OK, I'm going to read these really quickly then. Um, OK, so here's a great question. Um, Gen X workers were used to being worked to death in the arts. Younger generations aren't willing to accept that. But how does Gen X feel empowered to now follow the new rules? Are arts orgs just assuming that Gen X will continue to pick up the extra slack while younger generations demand better work-life balance? Whoever wrote this. That's heavy. We're, we're all in the same thing. I mean, not literally the same thing, but uh, the picking up the slack, the, the bill is due for everyone. Like, everyone is feeling the impact in a different way, and I think um, healing is difficult. Um, I think, uh, what is the thing I wrote down earlier? Uh, that perhaps healing is unafraid of facing fears and pain. Perhaps healing is not always the absence of pain, but the understanding of it. So I say that to say, like, perhaps the goal is for, um, to be inspired by um, the younger generation, open quote, end quote the uh, you know, 30 plus years of people uh, beneath you to make a different, cha uh, di a different decision. Um, Mich Michelle um, uh, D'Ancello said, you know, another day to try. So like activate your power in a different way instead of it being like, well, they're doing this and now, it, now I have to pick it out because um, in some instances we're not choosing to participate in our own degradation. But that, you know, that conversation about how do we bring generations together segues with this great question. Um, how do we find common ground with older workers to break those limitations wide open? And where does the responsibility lie to approach that conversation? I want to offer that the division is the mission. Like, this is the, this is the game, right? Like, our country is becoming more and more polarized. It's either you, it's either this or it's that. There's no, when, um, not just in a gender way, when we're talking about binaries, we're, we, I, I think the, the conversation around is talking about a spectrum of experiences. So, like, it's going to take everyone to kind of figure this out. So instead of like not allowing this group of people to like activate their power collectively, we will uh, siphon off resources, we will do this and laugh at you. Um, it just has to be more of a uh, dialectical experience than a didactic, like this is, it's either this or it's that, I think it's dangerous. Yeah, I'll add, um, I think my simple response to this whole thing that we've opened in terms of age difference is that um, the children are sacred and that the elders are sacred mm -hmm. and that both is true mm -hmm. and um, building more and more horizontal and circular spaces to hold the fullness of the team um, shows everyone how to not just get along but actually appreciate what the other is, is bringing. Um, and with that, um, to get out of binary thinking, to get out of uh, the capitalist notions of not ever having enough, of having to, generate, having to generate more and more, and that there is scarcity all the time, and there will never be enough time, and we have to pack our time. The energy we also have to put into disinvesting from a lot of these structures that then make it so hard for us to imagine new ways. Great, and our last question before we have to say goodbye for today is, um, what do you think that we, parentheses, especially those with decision-making power, will have to sacrifice or completely let go of in 2023? We're not in a reaping season. I think the, the productivity, we're saying we're back, but it's kind of like, not really. I think um, we've just gotten out of like, surgery and we're in the ICU right now so the the, the pace in which we um, are going to move at is going to take some time if we don't want it to crumble you know at the slightest uh, blow of the uh, wind so I, I think um, the pacing is important and I think um, understanding that we're planting and that it's going to take some time it's going to take care compassion practicing our courage what will next year bring I just think it's um, being purposeful and understanding that this is going to take some time because this is like systemic things and also 
that is going to look different in each organization, each position, but it, it's about beginning the practice and being vigilant. But I, I just think the pacing and um, being even better at having a vision. If we're not better about visioning the experience, truly the world that we want to do uh, create, and what the actual steps to produce that, like we would put a tour together, none of this is going to work. On that note, it seems like we're wrapped up for today. Thank you so much to our panelists. We covered a lot in that episode, and we're going to continue this conversation. In the next bonus episode of Arts Work Life, we'll answer some questions from the audience that we didn't get to during the panel and reflect more on the experience of young arts workers. Thank you for listening. Arts Work Life is a production from APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. APAP is the national service organization for the performing arts presenting, booking, and touring industry. You can join APAP at apap365.org. I'm Claire Caulfield, your host and producer. Jenny Thomas is our executive producer. And our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. This podcast wouldn't be possible without the generous support of the Wallace Foundation. So thank you. Other thank yous to Willie Santiago for organizing this great panel that you heard in the episode. Buoyant Partners for the on-site audio recording the APAP staff and board of directors, and the hundreds of thousands of arts workers across the world. Your stories matter, and arts workers are essential. Speaking of stories, season two is coming this summer. And if you work in the performing arts field, we want to hear your stories for this podcast. Submit them at artsworklife.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, which I hope you did, please leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Arts, work, life. <laughs> That's real. <laughs>